Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll talk to you about a change or something that the FDA announced a lo long time ago, but we don't know, we didn't know where it was now. And now they finally announced the alignment between the uh, QMSR, I mean the QSR and the ISO 13485. Uh, the the standard that everybody is using for quality management system in Europe. Um, and then they announced this alignment and I wanted to have a discussion about that and see what are the consequences. And for that, I have with me Navin Agarval, the creator of uh, the Let's Talk Risk. Uh, so uh, hi, Navin, how are you? I'm doing great, Monir. It's good to see you again. Great. So, yeah, Navin, we had discussions previously about risk because you are really uh, uh, making a lot of videos about risks. So, yeah, it's good to have you here today and discuss about this alignment in the U.S. But maybe for people that don't know you, can you just make a small introduction of yourself? Yes. Hello, everybody. It's nice to uh, connect with you and talk about QMSR, uh, especially because now there are going to be a lot of uh, overlap between quality system and risk management. My name is Naveen Agarwal, and I actually talk about risk as part of my Let's Talk Risk platform. I also offer risk management training and quality system training to colleagues who might be open to really building their competence from a practical hands-on point of view. I run uh, every Friday, I do a Let's Talk Risk, sort of very informal, casual conversation on LinkedIn. And Munir, we can share some uh, information about that in, in this podcast. And I sure. invite everybody to join and participate in these conversations. So um, mainly, uh, yes, we'll have uh, everything on the show notes. Uh, so your LinkedIn page and everything. Um, so as I said, we have now uh, an announcement that was made by the FDA and they are arrived and say, oh, we are now aligning um, our quality management system requirements that are for, for the FDA uh, with the ISO 1345. Because before it was really separated, they were really some separation to say, yes, there is ISO 13485 and there is QSR from our side. Now they change that and we have now QMSR, so Quality Management System Regulation. Uh, so um, can we say mainly what it is exactly? What, uh, what's, uh, I mean, what was the main difference before and maybe some of the problems, if there was some problems that it yeah. was creating for manufacturers? Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think there were any particular problems with the quality system regulation, except that it was last updated in 1996. The major update to a quality system regulation in a major global market happened in 1996 when design controls were introduced. Okay. And that was around the time when 13485 was also emerging and evolving. And FDA had already been involved in the development of 13485. So actually FDA's position now is that they think ISO 13485 2016 version has sort of caught up with what FDA's intent is in terms of regulating medical devices in the United States. So they feel like the timing is ready for them to officially harmonize and align with 13485. And the primary justification that FDA is offering is that it'll lower the burden of compliance on manufacturers who have to comply with 13485 anyway if they are global manufacturers and they are in essence running two parallel quality systems and there's a lot of documentation burden a lot of audit burden which uh, has been resolved to a certain extent with md sap exactly right so that was also another driver for the fda to kind of um, flip this switch it took them a while like they've been working on it for two years but now it got finalized but they feel like the manufacturers have good experience with MDSAP. And it proves that 13485 is actually fully capable of delivering a quality system regulation that FDA would find satisfactory. Exactly. So that is the kind of background behind this. It's, uh, it, it was time. It has been 25 years. And it's not that there were deficiencies in the quality system regulation. I don't think they were. No. But the way it was set up and implemented kind of promoted more of a checklist mentality. Exactly. So yeah. we'll talk a little bit more about that. Exactly. And and you're right. So mainly, um, it looks like when you are saying that, it looks like FDA um, uh, quality system was like already set up as is and ISO 1345 updated to arrive to this le the level of uh, of uh, well, FDA. Well, well, that is what FDA is. That's what FDA's exactly. position is. 
<laughs> right. They are saying that now the rest of the world has caught up with us. So now we're going to, you know, officialize our own quality system regulation. And oh, by the way, we're going to start calling it Q quality management system regulation. The exactly. term management is very important on how we get to talk about that. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's uh, completely fine. And uh, so, yeah, now they have made this announcement. They are talking about that. As, as you've said, it, it was already mentioned a few years ago and uh, we were just waiting to, to see when it will be done. So now that they have made this announcement, um, this is important, as you mentioned also about uh, MDSAP, it's also in the pro, uh, MDSAP was also including ISO 1345 plus all the five country uh, specific country requirements. So uh, after that, yeah, as you say, it really is the time to align. But in terms of alignment now, what, what means alignment here? What is the, 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 the term alignment exactly? Basically, what the FDA has done is that they have incorporated the entire ISO 13485 2016 revision by way of reference. Okay. So what they are saying is that by way of reference, we are including the entire ISO 13485 2016 version as part of our official quality management system regulation. And what that basically does is that you have to comply with all the clauses of okay. ISO 13485 plus some minor differences in definitions because FDA also needs to make sure that we are complying with the uh, food and drug food drug and cosmetic regulation okay like that's that's the law in the United States and they don't want to create kind of confusion or discrepancy with the law and that's what was the essence of MDSAP was too right MDSAP was 13485 plus the applicable regulatory requirement now with QMSR think about this with QMSR the delta between ISO 13485 and FDA's quality management system regulation, the delta will be much smaller under MDSAP. Yeah. Because it's entirely 13485. So the alignment basically means it is part of the regulation by way of reference. We don't have to print it out. We don't have to kind of, uh, you know, cut trees and have a lot of paper flying around. By way of reference, they have incorporated that into the quality management system regulation. That's what it means. So, um, one of the difference that we have in Europe and uh, in the US is the fact that uh, in Europe we are using for for getting this this approval of Q, uh, Q, the QMS with ISO 1345 we have a certification body that is coming and verifying that yes we are applying that etc um will this do you know if this kind of certification coming from this notified body will be like recognized by uh, FDA or it should be FDA that will be auditing the companies for that? I mean, how all this will yes. be working now? That's a great question, Monir. So I want to separate the pre-market versus post-market. In the pre-market phase, you have to follow FDA's pre-market requirements for 510Ks PMS, right? That's separate. Having a quality management system in place will actually make your case much stronger with the FDA in the pre-market phase. Now in the post-market phase, you can have a 13485 certification. Yes, you can. And it will give FDA some confidence that you are compliant. But that does not eliminate the need of an FDA inspection. And they will accept MDSAP. I know they have been part of the MDSAP uh, journey. Uh, organizations who are already following MDSAP will not need to have any additional FDA inspections. But if you're not following MDSAP and if you have 13485 certification, it does not, it's not a substitute for an FDA inspection. Let me. Let, that's my understanding. Let no, me no, clarify. It's, that. I, it's also my understanding, and I think it's 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 uh, it's how the US is is mainly working on that. It's like we are incorporating all the requirements of ISO thirteen forty five in our law, but it doesn't um, exempt you from having uh, FDA uh, checking what you are doing in case, for example, you don't have uh, you don't have any other things like MDSAP as you mentioned for mainly for for that. But yeah. um, it's 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 also interesting here to say. Um, ISO 1345, we had the version, uh, different versions. So we have now the 2016, uh, maybe we'll have a 2024, 2023 version, etc. So what will happen in that case when we'll have a new version, a, a new change yeah. to that? So will FDA again continue to align or at a certain point they can say, no, we are not aligning anymore to, to what they are saying? Because yeah. it's like copying, they are copying what is on the ISO inside the QMSR. So the ISO can update itself and QMSR can stay as is also. Yes, excellent question, Monir. Right now, FDA's position is we're going to be a part of 13485 revisions. 
and conversations, okay. which is basically telling me indirectly that we're going to influence them okay. to not change it significantly. In my opinion, 13485 2016 revision is an excellent, excellent framework for a risk-based quality system, which is also utilizing the process-based approach. So I don't see a big need to have any significant changes, but you know, as technology evolves, maybe artificial intelligence, machine learning, software, maybe there might be some changes for which FDA will be a party to that conversation, I believe very strongly. What they have said as part of this QMSR uh, final rule is that we will treat that on a case by case basis. So we will evaluate what the changes are in the next revision. And if there is a reason for us to update the QMSR, we will do so through the, by following the due process. Up until that point of time, you are required to comply only with the 2016 revision if you want to comply with the QMSR. So, so it'll be a case by case basis. So for manufacturers that are having QSR or ISO 13485, for example, we have also manufacturers in the Europe that goes to US and uh, et cetera. Yeah. So um, is there any big revolution here or with this alignment? Do they need to change something to their quality management system or no, there is no real change to be done here? I think if you are following both the systems, the opportunity here is to streamline and get efficiencies in your documentation system. And one example of that would be like FDA used to require specific records like DMR, DHF. Exactly. They are all going to be now part of your medical device file. So I think there's an opportunity for you to consolidate your documentation, strengthen your risk-based approach to quality management system. Uh, but those who are not following 13485 may have a little bit higher sort of challenge to comply with QMSR. But those who are, it should be minimal. That is what FDA is sort of telling people. But we know in, in reality, nothing is minimal. It takes effort, it takes resources and money, especially if you're a large, uh, diverse, multinational global organization. There will be some effort, but not as much as we might anticipate. So I hope that answers your question, Munir. No, it answers my question. And uh, um, as you've said, so for maybe the manufacturers that are in the US that we are following only QSR and uh, not looking at what's happening with the ISO 1345, uh, do, do you think that FDA will start also a campaign of audits for those companies that have to transition or it's not, it, or it will be just part of their routine check that they will be doing. Uh, so is there something they will intentionally start to do or it's not, they will just move? Um, as, it'll as be, a... I think it'll be just a routine process. Uh, first of all, FDA is allowing a transition period of two years. Okay. Between now, actually it'll be February, 2026. Okay. Manufacturers have time until then to update their quality management system to comply with the QMSR requirements. So, up until then, they have to comply with QSR. So it, it could be like a slightly challenging scenario in terms of managing the transition. Okay. Because if between now and 2026, they happen to have an FDA inspection, I believe they'll have to comply to QSR. But after 2026, they'll have to comply to QMSR. Okay. No, so nothing, so. nothing special will happen. I don't think FDA will require them to have like a pre-certification or a check or something. That's not how the system is working, at least in my view. Uh, they will just expect them to have a QMSR compliant uh, QMS by 2026. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. So in terms of uh, in terms of risk management, because mainly you are uh, really uh, helping a lot of people to understand more about risk management. Uh, so um, on the ISO 13485, it's a risk based approach. All what we are doing with the ISO 13485 is a risk based approach. Um, it, does this change something to what's happening also to the QMSR now? Will there yes. be a change on the way that they are reviewing also the risks? Yes, I think that is where the significant change would be. But first, I think it's it requires a change in mindset. Okay. Organizations who are complying only with QSR are used to doing business in a certain way. In QSR, risk is explicitly mentioned only in one place, even though there's a lot of discussion in the preamble, which clarifies FDA's expectations. 
But from a regulatory perspective, it's mentioned only in one place. That's in 82030G regarding software validation. Okay. That's it. With QMSR and alignment with 13485 by way of reference, we have to now go step by step and find out where risk is explicitly required. And Munir, I did a webinar very recently where I walked people through the explicit requirements of 13485 around risk, you know, okay. in personnel. For example, doing effectiveness checks of their training on competence based on risk. And I think the biggest impact would be on the supplier side, on the purchase product side. How much inspection you do? How do you qualify and select your suppliers? It's going to be all risk-based. And then finally, in the software validation side, it'll just expand the risk-based control requirements in a more explicit way. So the difference here, I think, is that we are shifting from sort of a, you know, unwritten rule and an expectation to more of an explicit expectation about risk in certain places. But across the board, FDA expects sort of a risk-based decision-making process because they're right in there. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I would really recommend people to download the FDA's final published rule from the Federal Register. And Munir, we can share the link I'll to put, that. I'll put that on the link on the show notes. Yeah, I have, I have looked at it also, yeah. What I want people to do is read FDA's responses to comments. And there were about 100 comments or so they have addressed. Read the FDA's responses and how they are explaining it. And what they are saying in one of those com their, their comments is that they believe unless you apply a risk-based decision-making process throughout the QMS, it's not effective. So FDA's thinking is that you have, it needs to be mindset. It's going to be a change in mindset. Is that, are we applying a process-based approach to different processes in our QMS? And are we look, making risk-based decisions and are we monitoring their effectiveness at the process level? So that is where the term management, in my opinion, in QMSR, management, it's not just top management. It's the management of process. That's my reading. Exactly. So yeah. it'll be a big change in mindset. Because, um, yes, we talk a lot about product risk with the ISO 14971. We say we have to protect the product. We have to avoid risk on the market, etc. Here we are more focused on risk on the management of your processes, management of, as you said, finding the right uh, supplier, working with the right processes, finding uh, make putting the indicators to identify if there is a risk of issues with the, inside your, your process. So is this for the US market like a, a shift in terms of uh, thinking or as you said, the mindset? I think, they, I think we'll have to go through a mindset change here because uh, if we are operating in a very compliance focused environment, uh, we look at QSR, we look at all the you know, different parts of the 820 regulation, uh, 21 CFR 820 regulation. And we say, are we doing it or not? Check the box, checklist. But when we go to the 13485 world, certainly the world is more around process-based approach, which allows us to really evaluate the effectiveness of each of our quality management system processes, each of them. And when we take that approach, we can go in many different directions, starting from, let's say, complaints handling. If we are evaluating the complaints handling, it's no longer sufficient to just say, oh, I have complaints files, I'm doing investigations, or justifying when the investigation is not needed, I'm reporting adverse events to the FDA as I'm required. It's not sufficient to just stop there. Because we're gonna ask, okay, what are we going, what are we you doing about the data and the patterns that you are identifying from the complaints data? How is it feeding into your improvement process? Uh, under clause 8.5, for example, are you doing corrective actions, preventive actions? So we have to start thinking about linkages between different processes. And FDA can now pursue each and every linkage to the extent they want during an investigation or inspection and basically find uh, evidence to support their claim of like your process is not effective and there's a reason why. So I think this is where people have to think beyond just documentation. They'll have to think about understanding each process inputs and outputs, what are the measures by which you evaluate effectiveness? And along the way, you know, how are you exercising risk-based decisions? Let's take the example of non-conformance, non-conforming products or rework, right? Making risk-based decisions and justifying them, documenting them will become very, very important. So that is like the undercurrent behind it. I think FDA has kind of, you look at all the recalls and warning letters, right? You find CAPA you find uh, complaints handling, you find adverse events reporting to be a problem, you find design 
process to be a problem. And they're like, they seem kind of separate problems on paper because that's the way QSR is written. But there's a connecting thread across all of them. And they, it all points to weakness in your risk management process. One final point I'll make here, Monir, uh, yeah. on this question. In the context of 13485, we have to understand the scope of risk is broader than 14971. Okay. Okay. 14971 is primarily concerned with safety. Yeah. Even though they don't, ex don't, don't explicitly say that. But ISO 13485 risk has three parts. Safety, performance, and applicable regulatory requirements. So that is why the process-based approach becomes even more critical because now you have to see, hey, anything that is happening in a certain process, is it impacting safety? Is it impacting performance? Which, by the way, FDA calls safety and performance as safety and effectiveness. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is it performing safety? Is it, perform uh, is it affecting safety? Is it affecting performance or effectiveness? Or is it affecting our ability to comply with regulatory requirements? So you have to look at risk in a slightly broader way compared to 14971. So here, as I said, FDA is making this move to, for the alignment, but what about, what do you think about the inspectors that are within FDA that were working with QSR since now maybe 20, 25 years? So um, do you think there is also a plan to educate those inspectors yeah. now because they have maybe to change their checklist? We have the QSIT, Document it, also, it, so yeah. there are a lot of things that they are they were yeah. creating, which was helpful for us when we were audited by FDA. So this this change is impacting a lot of things also within FDA. Yeah, for sure. And what I'm hearing is that FDA is actually going through a massive retraining program. Okay. And they also have planned an update to the QSIT manual, which is Quality System Inspection Techniques Manual. Exactly. It'll be a publicly available document, so anyone should. Uh, who cares about it, they should download it and review it. But what I've also heard from people who are ex-FDA people, I've talked to them about this topic a lot, and what they have told me is that FDA inspectors are already trained in following a process-based approach to their investigation during an inspection. They're already trained that way. Because first of all, they have the luxury of time. When FDA comes, it's not like a two-day exactly. sort of a notified body audit or a three-day notified body. They can be there for three months if they want to be. Exactly. So they are very, they are already familiar with how to do a process-based approach and follow audit leads in different directions. I think personally, this is just my view, is that now QMSR allows them to write you up in a little bit kind of more in a broader way. Their length. Like I, I do a lot of uh, case studies on warning letters and recalls, unless they're warning letters. If you read the language of the warning letter, they cite you exactly against the regulation. Exactly. But the evidence they are using to support that observation is generally, in many cases, risk oriented. It points to the weakness in the risk management process. So I believe that they, they will probably start using the language of risk explicitly when they write you up because 1345 has explicit risk-based requirements in different clauses. So that could be a slight difference and they will have to learn how to write them up. To me, the I don't expect a whole lot of change on the, on the investigator side. And you know, of course, some of them will be farther along the learning curve than others. So in terms you know, of- So it might change. Yeah, it might change, exactly. And um, here we talk about FDA specifically, but I suppose this will as MDSAP is linked with FDA rules also. So I suppose documentation for MDSAP will also change, which is not impacting just the FDA inspectors, but then all the auditing organization that are auditing for, for MDSAP then. I, well, I'm hoping that the, the like independent bodies who do MDSAP audits, I'm hoping they're already trained to it because MDSAP is basically a task-based auditing system and it's very process focused. So I hope they are already following along this process based approach to auditing and identifying weaknesses in the risk management system. But when it comes to FDA investigators, I think they might actually follow the new QSIT, have a little bit more training, and then start writing more explicitly their findings. If there's, there are weaknesses in the risk management. So, so I see that like maybe if someone is used to MDSAP audits, let's talk about that way. Many of the organizations are already used to MDSAP audits. I think they are 
already able to navigate the auditor's questions from a risk perspective. And I think they'll have a much easier time in uh, FDA sort of investigations compared to those who are not used to this. Yeah, agree. So certainly MD-SAP uh, practice and an MD-SAP compliant sort of quality management system will be a strength for people. No, I think it's great. Um, so um, I think you are uh, helping also a lot of manufacturers or a lot of people about learning on risk management and linked also maybe with uh, this QMSR. So um, are you having a specific events or specific uh, discussion that you have with them and maybe something regularly that people can, can follow up with you? Yes, absolutely, Munir. What I, what I have uh, decided to do is that focus a lot on this connectivity between risk management and quality management system throughout this year. Okay. And as a result of that, um, I've already started doing my monthly webinars on QMSR. I've started publishing articles on my Let's Talk Risk newsletter. There's a lot of content. And I'll also be bringing sort of podcasts like this. You and I are having a little bit more deep dive podcasts with uh, maybe regulatory compliance people, maybe ex-FDA people to get their views about this. So there'll be a lot of content available to people throughout this year on the Let's Talk Risk newsletter. So I really um, encourage everybody. Uh, a majority of the content, nearly 80% of what I write and share is free to everybody. So there's no reason for people to not do that. Maybe they're just not aware. So I hope through this conversation, Munir, they can be aware. Uh, but I will be doing a lot of work in this area throughout this year for sure. Sure. And uh, yeah, for people that don't know, so Navin is really expert in risk management. He's, he's making a lot of content on risk management mainly. Uh, so he has his own uh, channel for communication with uh, also people. You have also some live sessions where people yes. can also ask you questions directly, etc. So um, I will put anyway all the contact details on the show notes so that uh, then uh, people can, can join uh, your channel or even just follow you and see what... Uh, uh, what things, what events you are you are planning? Uh, but yeah, I really recommend that you are following with uh, Navin and uh, maybe also subscribing to this his newsletter so that uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can get really the up to date information about uh, what is happening in the, in in the market. Um, Navin, anything else? Yeah, uh, what I would say, I would close with a couple of quick comments, Monet. What yeah. I would say is, uh, even though FDA is allowing a two year transition period, I would strongly recommend that we start now. Yeah, always. We start right now. And the first thing we need to do is our own internal gap assessment. Because we, are, we know where the weaknesses are in our system internally. So take a look at that. It's not really that difficult, really. At the end of the day, it's not that difficult. If you follow 1345 or look it up, there are some best practices. There are guidance documents. Like what I would recommend people get is a guidance document from ISO TC210 committee yeah. on 13485 implementation. It's a wonderful resource to have. So don't wait. But more importantly, start shaping the culture of your organization from a compliance-focused culture to a quality-focused culture. And when you focus on quality, you automatically become better at risk management. So risk management should not be treated as something different. It is not something other. It is part of your entire way of doing things. Exactly. I think if you can begin to shape people, get them trained, get them connect with other people and learn. So training is just one part of competence building. Invest in your people is what I will also say. And there are many options available. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. mentioned my Friday conversations, yeah. which Munir, by the way, has very informal, casual conversations. Yeah, they, yeah. Are not, they are not webinars. And people can participate and connect with other people to learn these best practices. So I think we'll all have to work together uh, to take our industry to the new level. And I believe this is the right opportunity for us. So it might be tempting for us to see this as like another sort of a major change in the regulatory environment, but we should be actually doing this anyway. Uh, so, it's common sense, so yeah. It's common sense and I think we can. I believe we can because it is not that hard. We, we It just looks hard on paper, but when you talk to people, in a very simple, practical way, and you ask your questions, you get very you can get very practical answers. So I, I think I would encourage people in the next two years, you know, take a take a disciplined project-based approach. So treat this as a project management activity. Plan it out. Get resources from your management, get people trained, you know, review your documentation, 
get ready because if you postpone it for let's say another a year or so you will have much less time to catch up no, completely, right yeah completely agree and uh, yeah as i said if you're on this journey and learning and trying to apply don't hesitate to contact Navin or go to uh, the, the events of Navin. So ask your question also. It would be really helpful for you to uh, get the, uh, the, um, yeah, the advice from a professional also to understand yeah. exactly how to do that. Instead of you uh, trying to, during hours and hours to try to find a solution, yes. just asking a question, you'll get the answer and say, oh, it's like an epiphany for you. It's like, wow, it's, I didn't know about that. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and Moni, what I'll also say is that I, I, I don't want people to think that, you know, one person or me have all the answers. Yeah. It is only when we become part of a community of practitioners, which is what I'm trying to build, that we learn from each other. So the sooner you can become part of this group and a network of people, and Munir, you do a lot of work too, right? You produce yeah. these podcasts and you have a you are building a community. We are all in it together. So no one person has all the answers. Exactly. Actually, if they are claiming that they have an answer, they are really not right. <laughs> it's not the right way. Exactly. So become a part of a, a community, you know, engage, ask questions, but also share. Tell people what challenges you are facing so that other people can be aware of them and fix them, right? Let's help each other out. Let's exactly. not be kind of tight and protective about this. And that's how we can elevate the entire industry. Sure. I will place uh, all the information on the show notes uh, so that uh, you can contact uh, Navin and see also all the events, all the all the channels that he has. And uh, yeah, so Navin, it was really uh, really great to have your 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 information about this new change about QMSR and also the impact on the risk management because I think it was really the major impact that, uh, that we have. And yeah, I hope this will help people to um, align their process and then be ready for their future FDA inspection or yes. any inspection that they will have about, uh, about their quality management system. So Navin, thank you very much and I wish you a nice day. Thank you again, Manuel. Thanks.